Greetings, this is Greg. I want to talk about the German gyro gun sight, the EZ-42. This thing was used late during the war in Dora's and Messerschmitt 262s. Today I'm using it in a Dora 9 on the DCS simulator and we're attacking these B-17s. We got some good hits there, started a wing fire, which is great for us. A wing fire on a B-17 is very difficult for the crew to extinguish, so that airplane is almost certainly going down. We're going to come around and use our gyro gun sight to good effect and hopefully shoot down the rest of these B-17s without getting shot down ourselves, which is actually pretty tough to do in DCS, but the door is the right plane for the job, the EZ-42 is the right gun sight for the job. Let's talk about how to set up this gun sight and when you want to use it and when you don't want to use it. So at position one, we have the wingspan adjustment knob. Very important. The Dora gun sight requires three specific inputs from you, the pilot. If it doesn't get those, it's going to give you bad information and it's going to make you miss. In other words, it becomes a hindrance, not a help. So at position one, uh, this is just a knob you use to set the target aircraft's wingspan. So right now it's set to 11.2 or 11.3 because that's the setting for a Spitfire or a Mustang, two of the more likely airplanes to encounter in DCS. So that's kind of where I set it when I first get into the airplane. By default, it's set to 10 meters, which doesn't do you much good because the odds of encountering a Russian fighter, meaning an I-16 at the time of this recording, in DCS, in multiplayer, are fairly slim. It does happen. There are some guys that fly those things. But generally speaking, uh, you, if you don't adjust this thing, it's set for something you're not likely to encounter. So I fly around with it at 11.2 or 11.3, and then when I see another target, um, then I'll adjust it to that. So 31.6 in the case of the B-17s we're going to be attacking later. At position 2, we have an on-off switch. And the switch moves up and down. Don't think of it so much as on-off. Think of the up position as being the position for the gyro sight. And then if you don't want to use the gyro sight, you want to use the gun sight as more of a plain Jane reflector sight, move the switch down. That will shut off the gyro portion. And there are cases where you're going to want to do that. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. At position three, we have the range indicator. Right now it's set to 50 meters, which is ridiculously close. You can go from 50 to about 1,000 meters by twisting the grip on the throttle to adjust the range of the gun sight. And, of course, you're going to want that twist grip set to something on your controls you're using, a knob, a slider, um, a wheel, something like that on your joystick or throttle when you're in DCS. So... Two of the inputs the, air, the EZ-42 needs to calculate the amount of lead you're going to need, uh, we just covered. One, it needs to know the target wingspan, and then you need to set the range. And the way that works is, as you rotate the throttle, it'll make the circle in the gun sight bigger or smaller, and you set that circle so that the perimeter of the circle touches the target wingtips. And then, because it knows the wingspan, the gun sight now knows the range. There's one more thing you're going to need to, to have set in there correctly. So let's take a look at that. Here we have the altitude setting. The bullets from your machine guns or shells from your cannons will have different trajectories at different altitudes because the varying, or I should say decreasing, air resistance with altitude. Thus, if you don't put this in, your gun sight will not be accurate. And this is something that I think a lot of people miss. And it defaults to an altitude the Dora can't even reach. So you have to set this thing or your gyro gun sight is useless. You're gonna to wanna to set it to 100, a value of 100. If you're between zero and 2000 meters, and then well, the chart tells you what to do from there. We're up around 6,500 meters attacking B-17s in this video, so we're gonna have it set to about 76. All right, let's go back to our forward panel and talk about switch two. Why would you want to shut off the gyro gun sight? Well, there are a few cases. One, maybe you haven't had time to set it up, and as it will give you bad information, not good. If you're in a situation where you don't have time to set up the gyro, you know, you had it set for B-17s and you're getting bounced by thunderbolts or something like that, just turn the thing off. Don't go heads down trying to set up your gyro gun sight when you're in a fight. So there are times you just want to shut the thing off and use it as 
a regular reflector sight. The other time you're going to want to shut the thing off, and there are maybe two other times, is if you're at very close range. If you're at very close range, you don't really need to lead the target enough to matter anyway. And by close range, I'm saying maybe inside of 100 meters. In those cases, a lot of times you're better off turning off the gyro gun sight and using it as a regular sight. And the third time, and this happens quite a bit, if you're fighting an enemy fighter that won't hold still for you, um, you're fighting a Spitfire, let's say, that's he's not just simply out turning you because maybe he's damaged, so he's jinking like crazy, meaning moving very erratically to try and stay out of your gun sight. The gyro sight won't do you any good. And the reason is that you have to keep the target in sight for one or two seconds for the gyro to sort of settle down and stabilize before you pull the trigger. If the target just moves, if the target aircraft just moves through the gun sight very quickly, the gyro doesn't have time to stabilize and it's not really going to give you good information. So if you're attacking a fighter that's chinking all over the place um, or somebody at very close range or you don't have time to set it up, click the gyro gun sight off and use it as a standard reflector sight. But if you're shooting at a target at long range, the gyro becomes very useful. In fact, you can hit B-17s at 800 meters. In fact, during the war, people were hitting, reportedly, anyway, uh, German pilots were reportedly hitting targets at 1,000 or even 1,500 meters with this thing. But I find I'm, I can hit things pretty reliably with it out at 800 meters. I might use quite a bit of ammo doing it, but I can do it. And at 800 meters, you're a little bit outside the effective range of the B-17's gunners. So this is a pretty effective way to shoot down B-17's. Hang back at 800 meters and you can usually knock one of them out or set it on fire and uh, then break off and go do something else. So the gyro sight is good in that situation, long range shooting. The other situation where the gyro sight is really good is if you're dog fighting an enemy fighter and you're able to turn with him and keep him in your sights for a second or two before you pull the trigger, uh, then the gyro is going to give you very good lead information and you're going to put rounds on target. Now, the Dora doesn't turn very well though, so this doesn't come into play that often. I've got another video where I'm going to be talking about this quite a bit, but generally speaking, the only time you really want to turn fight with a Dora is if you're up against a damaged enemy fighter. Maybe not the only time, and this is a more complex subject, but generally speaking, you're going to be using this gun sight for long range engagements and any kind of steady state turn thing. Otherwise, shut it off and use the standard reflector sight. But the key is, if you don't have all of those three things set up, the target wingspan, the target range, and the altitude adjustment, it is going to give you bad information. And furthermore, you have to hold the target in your sight for one or two seconds before you pull the trigger or it's going to miss. But if you have all of those boxes checked, the target will be hit when you pull the trigger. It's very effective, even in my experience, in DCS all the way out to 800 yards with no problem. I meant to say meters there, but you guys are smart enough to know what I meant. So we're back in the simulation right where we left off. I'm going to head initially towards that bomber we already shot up, but he's still on fire, so no need to worry about him. He is definitely not making it back to base. So we're going to head for the other three and hopefully get them without being shot down. B-17s are visible from great distances, especially if they're contrailing. These aren't, but especially if they are. So there's always a lot of time to get the gun sight set up, and I did that before I made that head-on pass. I want to zoom in to a close range to show you how pointless the EZ-42 is if you set it up this way. And I see people doing this. The gun sight zoomed in to 50 meters of range, but the gyro on. Notice as I move the nose around, the gun sight crosshairs don't really move. That's because not a lot of lead is needed if you're shooting automatic weapons at an airplane sized target 50 meters away. Now when I zoom out, a little bit of motion causes that reticle to move all over the place. A tiny bit of movement of the nose will put the bullets way off target when you're shooting it at great ranges. So now I've got the gun sight set. I'm double checking my altitude. 76 is the setting there. I'm going to fine tune my wingspan adjustment because you want everything to be perfect, as perfect as you can get it if you're doing long range shooting. I'll need to keep the inclinometer, the ball in the center also, and that requires slight changes to the rudder pedals as the plane speeds up and slows down and I make small changes uh, 
to power to adjust my closure rate here. So I want to keep everything really steady and that's more difficult than it sounds. I want to open fire once the B-17's wing tips touch the circle, the, t the uh, edges of the circle, and of course I want the crosshairs to be right on the airplane. Now it's set perfectly so if I keep the inclinometer ball in the center the crosshairs are on and the wingtips are touching the circle when I squeeze the trigger I'm going to get some hits and I can get hits at 800 yards with no problem. The B-17's, I should say meters, 800 meters, the B-17's gunners become effective at about 600 meters and more effective at about 400 meters so ideally I want to get some shots on target at 800 meters hopefully set the plane on fire and ideally uh, then switch to another target and at least kill some of its gunners before I get in closer. So we're getting the crosshairs lined up. I'm getting the uh, range closer and closer. And again, once, once we're in range, we're going to squeeze the trigger and open fire on this thing. So just about there, almost there. There we go, we're opening fire. Takes a moment for the bullets and the shells to get there, but we see smoke, and unfortunately this was a big mistake. I thought I started it on fire, but I didn't. And now we're closing into their effective gun range. But I'm gonna open fire on this airplane just before we get there, and I may have killed some gunners. I didn't set it on fire, but I'm gonna stay with it until I do. There we go, now that plane is gonna be going down. I'm going to go back to the first airplane. We're definitely taking hits now, but uh, a lot of the gunners are dead in two of the airplanes, so things aren't as terrible as they could be. Hopefully we get this guy lit up here. Okay, he's burning. That second plane's upper turret is shooting at us, but I think the plane is going down. I think I can ignore it. I'm turning the gun sight gyro off. It's now just a regular plane Jane reflector sight, except with an adjustable size of the ring. But I'm not worried about adjusting anything on the gun sight. I'm just aiming the plane because we're close enough we can do that. And I really want hits on the wings because that's what starts fires and makes quick work of this. So now we've got them. All four B-17s are going down. Unfortunately, we've taken a fair bit of damage. Now, I could have done a better job by really taking my time and staying outside of the range of the B-17's gunners, but uh, I was a little bit impatient, and also I got to think about video length here. The point is, well, there are several points. One, that EZ-42 gun sight, if you set it up really well, enables you to shoot down enemy bombers from a safe distance. It's also effective against fighters, but that's another video. The EZ-42 gun sight is worth understanding how to use it. It really does work well. Now I'm checking behind us to check six procedurally. There are no other fighters up here. It's not a multiplayer server. This is a single player mission. So I'm not worried about those. And I'm also was looking behind to check to see if we're trailing smoke, oil, uh, coolant, fuel, anything like that. We're looking for a place to land. That's a nice airport, but it has bomb craters in it and it's a short grass field. I want an airport with a long, wide, paved runway because I'm bringing in a damaged airplane. So we're going to head over there to Carpaque. I'm not sure you can see the airfield there, but I know right where it is. It's at the uh, other end of the city. Carpaque has a long runway. It's paved. It's wide. Also, it's a big base, so it's going to have good crash fire rescue and an ambulance if this whole thing goes horribly pear-shaped. And if everything goes well, it has a decent town. I think we're going to have a pretty good time there. So that's where we're going to go. Now I'm setting my gun sight altitude to 100 for the 0 to 2,000 meter uh, range and we're going to set the wingspan adjustment to Spitfire or Mustang parameters because those are the more likely things to encounter down low as I return to base. Of course, again, I'm not going to encounter anything. It's a single player server, but for... Uh, it's not a server, it's just offline. But for procedural purposes you should stay on top of the gun sight adjustments as you climb and descend so that the gyro gun sight is ready for action otherwise it becomes uh, useless or even worse it ends up giving you bad information notice the panel is shaking like crazy that makes it hard to shoot the gun sight shaking like crazy that does not mean you have engine damage in the door we're going to talk about just what it does mean in just a few minutes probably after we land Right now, I want to say our engine is pretty good. All the indications are good. The temps are good. We're not leaking anything. Uh, the engine is fine. 
Speaking of temperatures, you have two temp gauges to concern yourself with here, a coolant temp gauge and an oil temp gauge. The coolant temp gauge has a aqua or blue-green ring around it. The oil temp gauge is just to the right of it with a brown ring around it. I'm trying to see Carpaque. It's hard to see, but again, I know where it is. So you can see the coolant and oil temp gauge. Last time I flew the Dora on YouTube, I mentioned that if you just leave the Dora's cowl flaps in the automatic mode, temperature will take care of itself and you generally only need to manually mess with them if the airplane is damaged. Well that seems to be no longer true. I don't know if there's been some sort of revision to the airplane. Um, perhaps the people that make this stuff found, they, maybe they talked to somebody that flew a Dora and they said, well that auto thing never really worked. Or it could be that the temperature of the maps that I'm flying on has, by the way, pay no attention to that momentary blackout. I was checking my recording stuff. Um, it could be that the temperature, the air temperature on the maps where I'm flying has changed. That's possible. Whatever the case, after about 30 minutes now, especially at higher power settings, you will very often have to manually adjust the cowl flaps on the Dora to keep the oil temps in check, not the coolant temps. Now, if you do that, you can still run the Dora at very high power settings for very long periods of time. You can even run it at war emergency power with the water methanol spraying for 20 minutes straight before you have to pull the power back. Uh, officially, it's 10 minutes, but you can get away with 20 minutes in this thing. So you can run a lot of power for a really long time, but you do have to um, monitor the oil temps and adjust the cowl flaps accordingly if you're doing that. All right, uh, we're getting closer to Carpaque. We're coming in pretty fast. I'm not going to fly any kind of a remotely correct traffic pattern. This is an emergency aircraft. We can do whatever the heck we want. Uh, here's a port that's often being struck by Allied aircraft. That's something you got to watch for if you're flying this map on a multiplayer server, at least on the Wolfpack server. Now you can see the airport pretty clearly. It's off at about the 2 o'clock position there, maybe 2, two to 3 o'clock. I'm going to start slowing down. I've got the power all the way back. When the door is descending, it's hard to slow it down. It's a pretty slippery airplane. It's more aerodynamic than a Spitfire Mark 9 and by a pretty reasonable margin. By German airplane standards, it's a very slick airplane. It's no P-51, but it's slick. So we're slowing down and I put out uh, takeoff flaps, which is basically the first of the uh, two lower flap settings. They can be up, takeoff, or landing. And I'm watching for roll moments, uh, the, because if one flap goes down and the other doesn't, that can be a pretty scary thing in the door. In fact, it can kill you. If you put the flaps all the way down at low speed and only one goes down, that's a bad scene. But uh, the flaps both went down. I'm putting the gear down, and I'm going to get full flaps in here. We're going a bit fast. We're doing 300 kilometers an hour. We should be doing 250 at this point. I messed that up a little bit, but I'll use a slip to get the speed down. I want 250 on final and then 220 on short final and as I cross the fence. It's a little tricky right now because the plane is really fighting me and not flying very well. I've got the power all the way off and now I'm bringing the power back in to hold the speed. I feel like I'm on the right glide path and at the right speed, but uh, like I say the plane is just a handful right now, but hey, at least it looks like we're going to get it back to base. So, coming in, checking that speed, you're looking at two things, airspeed and the runway, and that's it when you're on short final like this. And right around here, I'm starting to pull the power off, and not a great touchdown, and it turns out the left wheel, while down, was not exactly down and locked, and that's causing the plane to pull to the left really hard, so I'm struggling with this more than is apparent. I've got a, light, a lot of right rudder in, a little bit of right brake, and uh, the sticks all the way to the right. And uh, I'm able to keep it under control though. Now if this was a multiplayer server, we'd be getting it off the runway right away because a plane on a target is, or a plane on a runway is an easy strafing target. It's just easy to spot there. Harder to see airplanes when they're off in the grass. So I'm going to get it off in the grass now, and then we're going to shut it down. And you guys know, of course, we shut down aircraft engines by cutting off the fuel and the way you do that in the Dora is by pulling the throttle to the idle cutoff stop. Once the engine stops turning I'll shut off the magnetos and the fuel selector valve. I'm not going to shut down the entire airplane as I might want to use the repair option and take off again. Now all that vibration was caused by 50 caliber hits from the B-17s to the Dora's propeller. 
It reduces the plane's performance, it makes aiming very difficult due to all of the shaking, but it's not immediately threatening. As long as you can avoid enemy contact, this type of damage usually won't stop you from getting back to base. The EZ-42 gun sight came out just after D-Day. Most Doras had the Revy gun sight, as shown here in this drawing from the aircraft manual. That makes the Dora with the EZ-42 pretty special, and I'm glad it was so well modeled in the DCS simulation. As for the tactics I used against the B-17s, the frontal attack was historically accurate. That was done quite a lot. However, the tactic of slowly closing in behind the bombers to take advantage of the gyro sight's long-range accuracy probably isn't historically accurate. I do think that in a technical sense it would have worked, but by the time the EZ-42 was on the scene, Allied fighter escorts would have made this tactic just about impossible to use. That's not to say that it never happened, but I certainly don't think it was a common or a standard practice. It couldn't have been common because so few of these gyro sites made it into the German fighters. Secondary sources say that only about 700 EZ-42s were built, and of those, only about 200 actually made it into airplanes, and I suspect that of those, only a small number, like maybe 50 or 100, actually made it into combat, maybe fewer. If you want to know more about the origins of the gyro gun sight, you'll probably like this video. The gyro gun sight is one of the many British contributions that tend to go unrecognized. I appreciate that you watched all the way to the end. I want to thank my supporters on Patreon who make this channel possible. Patreon members get access to all my sources and early access to these videos and in an ad-free format before they go public. Supporters on Patreon also participate in polls to determine the channel's direction. That's all for now. Again, thanks for watching and have a great day.